Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're really excited to have you. We're even more excited to have our guest, Katie Gaston, who just flew in. I'm going to use that old joke, and boy, are her arms tired. Just flew in from Toronto, arrived early, early, early this morning. What time, Katie, did you get in? I think I got into bed at one o'clock, so <laughs> that's okay, though. Got some good sleep. It was great. And I am ready to talk about finding new donors. I love it. <laughs> well, this is always a topic we need to be having. I know you addressed uh, everybody at ICON about this. And so it's going to be really a great time to, while you're fresh off the speaking speaker's track, to get into this. Um, Everybody, we've got a really exciting thing we're rolling out. We have a new panel of co-hosts they come from all over the country they're extremely diverse in who they serve how they serve the knowledge that they have and we're rolling these folks out you've probably already met some of them but um we want to make sure that you know that that's where we're going it's very very exciting i'm just super super thrilled with this i'm also thrilled with the continued support we have with our major presenting sponsors and they include the amazing Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out so we can have folks like Katie with us. Katie, really briefly... I know you're a rock star because in the green room, you shared with me that you're coming to Scottsdale as like a major part of the president's team cabinet award winner. What is the title? <laughs> oh, it's president's club is what it's called. But thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, I know you do great work. We've had you on before, but talk to me a little bit about what you do within the amazing family of Bloomerang. Uh, that's a great question. So as a product marketing manager, what I like to say is I'm a storyteller, um, which I think I think in some ways in different roles, even as development directors, in some ways you could say we're storytellers because we have to share the story in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So with within Bloomerang, I'm a storyteller about how um, our <laughs> tools really help drive success for nonprofit organizations. And when you think of what it means to be a storyteller, you have to understand who are you telling your story to? What are the things that, for example, donors really are passionate about and care about? And how do I ensure the way that I craft my story for in case a nonprofit or Bloomerang really um, resonates with what is meaningful to the individual who's hearing your story? So that's what I do. <laughs> I love it. You know, I think that's a, um, a it's a, a foundational um, approach. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you have that ingrained into your habits and the way that you navigate your your life and your work, it 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 just is a part of how you you work. And I think exactly. it's brilliant and it definitely moves you forward. OK, talk to us about meeting people where they are when they are inspired to give. And we have an image for our our listeners um, somebody, he, it looks like he's on the street, he's got his phone, he's got a credit card or a debit card, something's happened and he's ready to give. What does this look like for most of us and how can we get there too? So when we think of finding new donors, taking it even a, a little bit further, a step, step up of that, mm -hmm. what are the type of donors that we may want to attract this year? Now, one that we hear a lot from our nonprofit customers and those in the community is younger donors, uh, especially let's say if you're in an arts organization, let's say a symphony, we we see a lot of aging donor populations. And <laughs> one, thinking of a long-term sustainability path for your organization, attracting younger donors is critical to continuing that curve of growth. The second element of that is wealth generational transfer, which I'm sure you have heard quite a bit about in the in the community. But in the, the next decade, uh, it's expected that over $150 billion is expected to transfer generationally to younger donors. 
Uh, so when we think of, okay, let's, how do we meet people where they are? We first have to define who are those people who we're meeting. And let's say for younger generations of donors, using things like digital wallet items uh, or breaking that down, PayPal, Venmo, Google Pay, Apple Pay. I'm sure we've all been in an event when someone asks you, can I just Venmo you for <laughs> that shirt at the fun run you have? Um, how exactly? We're all on our phones every single day. So how do you enable using technology, the ability to accept a donation when someone, either a generational donor that you typically serve, maybe that's an older generational donor, or a younger generational donor is interested in giving to you. Um, how that shows up, I would say, is a few things. Like, for example, enabling PayPal or Venmo or Apple Pay and Google Pay on your online donation form. Mm -hmm. Did you know, Julia, that by simply turning on things like Apple Pay and Google Pay, that research shows that you can increase your donation page conversion rate by 8%. Wow. And if That's you, a lot. Katie, Katie, <laughs> Katie, think about if you tried to improve your just your own portfolio's behavior by 8%, you'd be a rock star. Oh, 100%. <laughs> I mean, wow. Yeah, not oh, only wow. that, but there's also research that shows when individuals give in ways, like through digital mediums, uh, text fundraising campaigns, uh, we're all on our phones. Again, meeting people when and where they're inspired to give is an amazing way to raise a significant amount of funds. The other element of that, which, okay, imagine you've been to, you. when was, did you do a fun run, let's say last year, or have you been to a ga gala or an auction last year? Julie? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm on the rubber chicken circuit. I'm, I'm okay. at something every week. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah. Of, of course. I, I mean, literally every week I'm at something, uh, yeah. And do you keep cash on you or do maybe most of your friends keep cash with you today? <laughs> you know what? Not anymore. And I'll tell you, yeah. I'm traveling uh, tomorrow and okay. I was getting ready and I was like, oh, I don't have any cash. And then I was like, mm, do I really need it? I mean, that's yeah. really where you wouldn't have gone to the mailbox without cash in your wallet, right? Exactly. Now yeah. it sits there. It sits there. No, no one's using it. So if you hear, you know, I'm in the Rotary Club, that's every Thursday morning, I go to my Rotary Club. And almost every week, we have speakers from different nonprofits that come and share their mission with us. Mm -hmm. And so often, 7am in the morning, I've got my coffee down, I am moved to give just because I'm so impressed by the work they're doing in our community. Yet, very few ask for a gift in that moment. So imagine as a donor, if I had the ability to accept a donation on my phone, Literally, without even the QR code is one option. So if you do speak and share your mission, minimum, I would highly suggest have a QR code up where people can scan and give to you that links to an online donation page. Mm -hmm. But even better, what if I could just have someone's card tapped to my phone and immediately someone accept a donation? I'm wondering if you can help us understand when you talk about younger donors and that's the buzz, everybody's talking about that. Yeah. Um, what does that look like? I mean, what is that age group that we really should be thinking about? Because I suspect it's different than what most of us would typically define. What does that look like to you in Bloomerang? That's a great question. I think when we start thinking of quote unquote younger donors, where we see that generational gap or divide in terms of behavioral differences is really millennials, millennials okay. and younger. So generation Z. And I think there's, I heard generation alpha. I'm not sure if I got that particular term correct, but yes, youngers, even than generation Z are continuing to engage particularly and prefer digital or digital communication and digital donations. Um, I don't even remember the last time I, I I didn't use tap to pay. And I, I would say I'm a millennial. So I, I don't remember the last time I didn't use tap to pay with a credit card. And if I had the ability to give in that way to a nonprofit, I would be so much more likely and willing to donate in that moment when I'm inspired to give. Right. Yeah. I love this message that you're delivering because wow, if I can just go back to your 8%, to me, that rocks my world. 
an 8% increase. Um, and that is, that's kind of like benign fundraising in some ways, because mm -hmm. you're not like there with your digital device navigating it. That's somebody coming onto your site, maybe two in the morning, or, you know, they hear something on the radio or they see something. It's very organic. What a powerful thing. Completely. And think of how much energy you've invested already to get them to your site. And then just having them leave because you didn't give them the ability to give how they prefer to give. I mean, what a missed opportunity. So looking for easy ways to integrate a more simple giving option is the easiest low hanging fruit I could recommend in terms of capturing donors when they are inspired to give. Yeah. Wow. I love it. Well, as much as I love that, I've got to move on um, okay. and talk about this piece. And you're really advising us to be conducting proper research. What does that look like? And then I'm also going to push you a little bit. Is this only for like the super institutional size nonprofit? I mean, how can small startups or just small nonprofits navigate this as well? That That is an excellent question. So Research comes in all forms and fashion. I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning, where I said I'm a storyteller. And one of the things that I said in a way that we sh are all storytellers, <laughs> we're storytellers of our mission, we're storytellers of impact. Um, but the key thing of telling stories is understanding your donors. Um, and there are so many things you could do, even without fancy software tools, in order to help you understand donors more intentionally. So when we think research, research can be either on one scale, talking with donors, asking questions. How did this story resonate with you, for example? Or what are you interested in seeing as it relates to our mission and the work that we're doing? You can do that through surveying donors in your network or maybe just surveying individuals that could be donors. So those both that are currently donating to you or prospective donors yeah. in the community in order to really narrow down and hone in on how you are telling your story. Um, so surveying, that can either, again, be through sending a survey, like I'm going to write a survey and then send that out through something like email or just having conversations. So when we think research, there's both quantitative research, which is more numerical, and qualitative research, which is understanding patterns, mm -hmm. thoughts, and that's typically more um, driven through uh, dialogue and conversations. So that's one way to do research. I think the other way is using software tools like Wealth Insights. Mm -hmm. uh, now, wealth, what is Wealth Insights? I'll explain that a little bit. Wealth Insights are a tool, typically one, for example, in the, the market that Bloomerang integrates with is donor search. So using a tool where there's a database of how much individuals are giving, when was their la last gift, um, how much and what is their capacity to give, and layering that information on top of your donor information today. Now, that could either be for finding new donors, that could either be in expanding your donor database, so saying, who in my community wants to give to my mission that I might not be talking with today, mm -hmm. or that could be finding really qualified donors in your current donor database as well. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Julie? It does. And there? It, yeah. It, it does, and it almost seems like... Um... Again, when we started off, you know, the top of our conversation about the behavior and the patterns that that we use or that we embrace doing our jobs, um, this almost seems like it should be something that we're kind of always looking at um, versus, OK, we haven't done any research for three years. Let's, you know. Right. And, and that's where I wonder, like, if we get if, if we really trip over our own feet thinking that. We have to have this exhaustive, expensive, you know, crazy investment of outside with outside people or upheaval mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. data that a lot of times I think we could have been doing it internally. In more I think in that's a great, that's a great, great call out because research should be not something that feels like you said, exhausting or, oh my gosh, now I have to do this major research study. I have to find someone to help me with it. No. It should be something that you build into every month. 
maybe you block off a day of your calendar and you say, okay, this is my donor research day. Um, if that's all you can start with, that's a fantastic initial start. And um, because at the very least, it's less about you're right, that big initiative to get all the information and more of building, learning, and then adaptation into your regular process in developing how you speak with donors. It almost seems to me as well, and I'd love to get your feedback on this, um, a, a pattern of curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, they always say the best fundraisers are those who listen, you know, they oh, ask completely. and they listen. And it, uh, it, it seems to me like it, it fits into that personality profile or behavior. I mean, I don't know if you see that or, or is that just something in left field? No, I think that that's, that's really accurate. It's a research in another word, like you just said, is simply listening in, with intention mm -hmm. and using that listening in order to pull out patterns that then influence your behavior. So it's listening on a one-on-one -on -one conversation or it's listening using a written medium and then using that in order to alter some of the paths that you move forward with in the future. Does that, would, do you feel like that's a, a good framework in terms of what the research could be? I do, because okay. I think like one of the things that you, you've said, and you've said this before when you've been on the nonprofit show, is that, hey, kids, things are changing. Our donors are changing. The way they think is changing. <laughs> and yes. we might be serving our clients and our community in the same way. Great. And that's important. But our donors are living in a different world, in a different ethos, technology, sentiment to be involved, not be involved, all these things. And so we got to be thinking about these changes. So that's kind of one of the things I hear you I mean, maybe it's just me, but I feel like you're pushing us a little bit to say, look, it's not the same old, same old. We got to be reformatting how we work with donors. And, and, and yes, and, and how donors perceive our messages differently, depending on things like how much capacity they have to give or their age and where they are in their giving life cycle, because you're right. You could be saying the same thing and it could land really well with one group of donors and you've always had success with those, but you may need to alter how you're saying something because you're speaking and attracting a younger generation of donors. Yeah. So, it's, yes. it's really, I think this is fascinating. I think it's just fascinating. Okay. One last research question. It just popped into my mind. Um, if you are going to lean into this grand, you know, big time, uh, research project, you know, all that, what's the appropriate amount of time? Like, should this be done like every three years, five years, 10 years? I mean, do you have a sense of that? If we're going to, if we're getting pushed to really do some groundbreaking donor research, what does that look like to you? In my perspective, I think minimum every year is healthy. Okay. Um, it depends on really the level and depth of research you're doing. Mm -hmm. So for example, with Wealth Insights, if you ran a screen every year, assuming you're attracting new donors on an annual basis of what your donor database looks like, that then gives you a really solid starting foundation, let's say at the start of the year, to plan intentional campaigns around those different segments of donors. And from a qualitative perspective, how much how much did what you think earlier? Uh, let's use the perspective, and maybe this is a, a little uh, biased, but of twenty twenty versus twenty twenty two. Oh, <laughs> how much was our world different in even oh. those two years? Oh. And, and what what we were willing to support? I mean, a hundred percent. You, you know, my support of cultural institutions just bottomed out and I moved everything that I could, you know, financially, mentally championing human services. Entirely. Whether that's, whether that's economically what's happening, whether that's generational um, yeah. adaptation um, or even things, you know, what our, our world is moving so fast, the increase of AI in the last year. And, and while you could say, well, does that really change? 
preferences, I think that we are going to start to see um, different expectations of how donors may uh, be communicated with as tools and technology increase in the ability to make communication faster and more personalized in a really robust way. So if you can set a goal every year, maybe the start of the year of doing a research to update your assumptions and, and not rest on prior, you know, to validate your assumptions, I think that you'd be in a really good spot. Okay, good. I appreciate yeah. you giving us that lens because I, I I would not have thought that. And uh, so I appreciate you setting me straight. Well, let's go on to the last place where we can be finding new donors. And I wanted to say maybe the best for last or the most like cringeworthy for last, because I think in the nonprofit sector, and I have worked with nonprofits and served on boards where they're like, this is verboten. We do not ask volunteers for anything, you know, other than their service. And please help set us straight. <laughs> I thank you. Yes, I will. <laughs> because did you know that there was a research study? I want to say it was in 2020 that showed 92% of volunteers are likely to donate to your organization. Now, imagine how many volunteers that you have in your pool today. When was the last time you asked them to contribute in a more meaningful way? Um, now I could say, for example, I think there's two elements here. One is who are typically volunteers? There's two sets, I would say, of volunteers that we see most commonly. One is maybe younger generations that don't have the ability to give treasure, but they can give time. And for years, I volunteered since I was a kid. Um, yeah. And I, you know, as I've continued to progress, I've been able to give more treasure. But the organizations like Rotary that I invest in, I started volunteering with when I was 20. <laughs> And because it, it, I've continued to stay in that network and that organization, um, if I had been really passionate about something and they hadn't engaged me in a more meaningful way long term, or maybe downplayed my value uh, as someone who can give, then maybe they wouldn't be in my circle or network anymore. And now that I have the capacity to give, um, I wouldn't give to them. So investing in volunteers, even young volunteers, is an excellent way to build a donor pipeline long term. And the other element of that goes back to what I said earlier, which is generational wealth transfer. You may have individuals that can't give today. They don't have the capacity to give. But what will that look like in five years when there starts to be that really massive transfer of generational wealth? So that's one set of volunteers is that's an amazing way to grow and cultivate and nurture an influx pipeline of lasting, sustaining givers long term. And then the other is individuals who are empty nesters, who are retired, who are going, I have free time. You know, my parents volunteer all the time. I'm giving back and I'm contributing in meaningful ways. And that's another set that maybe they do actually have quite a high capacity to give. Or maybe they would long-term be uh, potential individuals to seek out for planned giving initiatives. But ultimately, maybe they're just starting to give time. And so cultivating them and seeing them as a potential donor. If you don't, I think it's a massively missed opportunity. Yeah. I, I mm -hmm. mean, I think, it again, I keep harping on this 8% that you, you know, helped us to understand by engaging, you know, digital giving platforms on your website. I swear to God, look at your volunteers. And if you're like, if I could get an 8% return or bump. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's, that's revolutionary for a lot of organizations. And yeah. that, I I just think it's fascinating how, and I'm going to use the word fear. I think we're fearful of asking, of, too much. Of, of asking the volunteers. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, you made that comment. You don't even get an option to participate or not. Because you're not even given the opportunity. Completely, to. completely. It's like I think so. There's there's two things to kind of consider. So one is, especially if you're an organization that has more volunteers that support your mission, mm -hmm. making sure those individuals are in your donor database. Ideally, if you have a tool like volunteer management that integrates with your donor management system, there's you're you're not missing the gap here. You're not trying to juggle between two systems. And then going back to what we talked about with research. Running something like Wealth Insights on top of those volunteers can give you at least the transparency to understand 
are the individuals who are giving, do they have a capacity to give? So maybe you don't reach out to your entire volunteer base and say, oh, please, you know, give to our mission on a sustaining basis, mm. but use a little bit more research to influence how you segment those individuals and then reach out strategically to the ones that you know may have a higher capacity to give. I, yeah. I think this is really important. And I think, you know, it's also we are building champions of our organization. You just don't know when somebody volunteers and then they go back out into the community and they're like, they tell, you know, somebody that has never heard of you or, or is going to maybe be a potential oh. partner or whatever. It is such an, an activation of, of championship is what I, is how I think of it. You know, you're really building that cadre of people that can come out or go out into your community and impact you. And, and man, it's such a missed opportunity. And so Completely. I, I'm, I'm thrilled so, that you would talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. Entirely. You know, you are a champion because as we said earlier, you just left Toronto in the last <laughs> 24 hours to get home to Idaho where you were speaking at Icon. So we have Katie fresh off the stage because you were talking about this there. Mm -hmm. And um, it really been fabulous, Katie, to get you back on another episode of the nonprofit show. Um, I always love what you have to say. It's um, I find you give us advice that's very achievable and sometimes we don't hear that. Sometimes we think we hear things. It's like, well, yeah, if I had an extra 50 grand, I'd do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's the most frustrating. No, you need yeah. tools and tactics that you can say, okay, tomorrow. Okay. Challenge then. What are you doing in the next two months to yeah. ask your donors questions and listen intentionally? That's your homework, everyone. <laughs> I love it. Well, yeah. that I am definitely doing the homework. Cause I love, <laughs> I love what you said. And I think that's an amazing thing. And uh, I think what we need to do is we need to put this homework out there and then we'll get you back on and, Perfect. We'll, and, see this. How it <laughs> and we'll be like, okay, what happened when you did this? Because yes. Um, yes. great advice. And always you and your, your team members at Bloomerang always give us lots of advice. Again, we've been with Ga Katie Gaston, Senior Product Marketing Manager at the amazing Bloomerang. Check out bloomerang.co or bloomerang.com and you can find all the different things that they're doing. One of the most impressive things about Bloomerang is not just their business model and the products, but they share a phenomenal amount of knowledge and it is free. You do not have to be uh, a client or navigate a paywall. It is stunning how much research that they do or they bring to the table. And so it can be one of your best partners. And I would say, Katie, nonprofit management. It's not just fund fundraising and donor management. I mean, it goes well beyond uh, that. I think your your materials are amazing. So kudos Thank to you, you on them. Um, really you. important. Hey, another thing that's really important are presenting sponsors. And we would be remiss if we didn't ex express our gratitude it includes Nonprofit Thought Leader, American Nonprofit Academy, of course, Bloomerang, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and JMT Consulting. These folks are with us day in and day out, and it's really cool to see how they support us so that we can, in turn, support the nonprofit sector. So, Katie, you really... Man, you pushed a button on me today. <laughs> I that love eight, it. That eight percent of adding the pay portals on a website. Holy cow! I know. I know. <laughs> Remember that next time you give through PayPal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as we say in my family, holy, holy vaca, because that is a holy cow moment. Um, stunning, stunning improvement um, and connectivity with donors. So, thank you for sharing, my friend. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, as we end every episode with this message, and, and I always say this, it means something to me in a different way every day. But our message goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. <laughs>